Hello, everyone. This is Michael Raymer at the University of Oregon. Once again, we're now in week four, day one. And I notice that some of you have been doing the reading quizzes. That's fantastic. And I encourage everyone to do them. Um, so today we're going to discuss a number of things focusing on quantum interference. First, let's review what we said last time about classical and quantum probability theory. Classical probability theory is based on three important principles. There are a few others, but these are the most important ones. Um, we just basically have the intuitive idea of probability based on a number of outcomes and a number of equally likely outcomes. Uh, we have uh, the idea that when you have mutually exclusive outcomes, A, B, and C, and if you group them together into a single class or a single group, like A or B or C, and you don't care which one it is, you just want to know if you've got one of those outcomes, you can add those probabilities if they are mutually exclusive. Like if a ball could either be, you know, red, blue, or orange, and what's the probability that it's red or blue? That would be an example. Um, in other words, you don't care if it's red or blue. You just want to know if it's in the class red, blue. Okay, so the third principle is that if you have independent events, like two different balls, and you're pulling them out of a hat, and you want to know what's the color, the probability that one has a certain color and the other has another color, if those are independent, you just multiply those probabilities. Now, in contrast, in quantum theory, which applies to not everything in the world, like not colored balls, but it does apply to electrons and photons, and quantum bits in a quantum computer, of course, in that case, uh, the second principle needs to be modified because of superposition. Sometimes, as we saw last uh, class, we first add the state arrows, which are represented by mathematical vectors on a grid, and then we square the length of the projection of that arrow onto the measurement axis, and we get the probability, which is called Born's rule. Now let's apply this rule to a more complicated case where we have more than one way to reach the same possible outcome. So I made this little cartoon of a pinball machine. If a, if a particle is launched up here and it falls and bounces off, off this slanted pin and then off this slanted pin and then off of this um, horizontal pin, you could arrange it so it has 50% probability to go one way or the other. Okay, or you could arrange it so it goes on the left path and then has 50% probability to go one way or the other. Or if you made the top pin horizontal, it could go right and then right, or it could go left and right, or it could go right, left, or it could go left, left. So you see, to get to the car, there's two possible paths that this particle could take. However, if you do the same experiment very carefully with an electron, you find that under certain conditions, the setup looks the same, but it always goes to the left, never to the car. Now, if you make a very small change to the setup, you can force it always to go to the car and not, not to the goat. So what is going on? It's very different than a classical probability, of course. So here shows the, these different uh, possibilities. How, two ways to get to the car. You could go to the right and then go to the right, which I call path A or it could go to the left and then to the right, which I call path B. Uh, you, if, if this occurred by itself, you would just have probability A squared to get to, to the car, where A is, is the projection of the final state arrow onto the measurement axis, which would correspond to the, the car axis. The perpendicular axis would correspond to the goat axis in a grid diagram. But you could also have this other path the path B, which also leads to the car. Now, this could have probability B squared. Now, in classical probability theory, you would just add those probabilities or you would add the squares. But we know that in mathematics, if you just have A plus B squared or A minus B squared, you get different results because there's a plus 2AB here and a minus 2AB here. It depends on the phase between those two. So let's look at that in a diagram. If the A path, which is the right, right path, leading to the state C, 
is shown here, and it has this red arrow, this red arrow, which has a projection onto this C measurement axis with a length at little a. And the perpendicular axis is called not C. So it's C and not C. And when we only have two possibilities, like in any qubit, we can always represent the states on a, on a uh, you know, square grid like this. Now the other path where you go left and then right, it's called the B path, it has a state arrow points down here, for example, I just made up these examples. And if I, if I project that state uh, vector onto the measurement axis, the C axis, I get this blue line whose length along this direction is little b. Now because these are pointing more or less in the same direction, I add them together and I get here C plus uh, or A plus B equals this gray line, which is C, which and I square that to get the probability and it's a large probability. Okay. However, I, so in this scenario, with this state, I get a large probability to land at the C point and win the car. However, if I just make a small phase change, I keep these probabilities the same for these two paths, but I just ch make a phase change between this path and this path. And I can indicate that by taking this blue arrow and just flipping it across the axis. So now it's over here, it has the same length. So when I project it onto the C axis, the length is still B, but now it's in the minus direction. So it's minus B. So now when I add these two together, I get A plus minus B equals C, which is this small negative gray arrow. And if I square that, I get C squared, which is a smaller probability. So this shows that just by changing the phase of one of the possible paths, I can get interference. I can make the probability large or small. Very good. So how do I change the phase in this diagram E? If I just move this uh, pin slightly, I can change the path length along this right, right path only by a very tiny amount, say like a few nanometers. You know, you know, billionths of a meter. If I just move that by a tiny amount, change the phase, but don't change any probabilities. I can flip it from a zero probability to go to the car to high probability to go to the car. If I move it again up slightly, I can flip it back to the goat and have a, and have a zero probability at the car. The other trick I can play is I can block one of the paths. I see a question just popped up. If I block a path, then uh, we're back to classical probability because when the electron, if it doesn't hit the block, it, it means it came this way. And now it just has 50-50 probability to go in the two paths. So by blocking a path, I can increase the probability to get the car compared to this case, which seems rather counterintuitive, right? Here I have a case where uh, I, I have zero probability in case D to get to the car if I have two paths. If I block one path, I actually increase the probability to get to the car. Whereas classically, you might think it would decrease that probability. Okay. Dr. Raymer. So yes. There is a question in the chat. You want to read it because I can't see the chat right now. Oh, okay. In this, in your example, the electron always lands on the guilt just to demonstrate the phenomena, or is it, or it really depends on the geometry in that picture? Uh, in this picture D, it, it uh, lands on the goat to illustrate the principle. And I've assumed here that I've moved this uh, pin on the right hand side to the precise location, which makes interference lead to the goat always. If I move this pin slightly by a few nanometers, I can flip it to the car. So the, these are only, you know, these are for illustrating the principle. And you're under, you're in control of this as the experimenter. Okay, thank you. Now we're in our review. So let's do a demonstration. I have a, my interferometer, which I, uh, which I built with the, the Heal Neon laser, which you saw before. I have a knob up here. I'm gonna rotate that knob very tiny amount and I'm gonna flip, I'm gonna uh, start out with just a single beam here. And then I'm going to rotate this knob slightly and the beam will disappear here and reappear here, just like quantum magic. Okay. So what we have is we have our helium neon laser. Like this, as before, the beam is coming out here and then it gets transferred by mirrors over to here, you can see. 
it goes through a calcite crystal. It starts out with, um, with a polarization, anti-diagonal. That's the way the laser is set up. And then it goes into this calcite and it gets split into two beams. Now, as before, you cannot see on the screen that there's two beams here because the resolution is not good enough. But in fact, there are exactly two small beams very close to each other here. Now, this is a calcite with the axis H and V. So the incoming beam is A. So it gets split into two beams. One is H and one is V. Now I go into a second calcite, which has been flipped around so that it's set up so that if I sent a polarization in this way, backwards, it would get split into H and V over here. But what I'm doing is I'm putting H and V into it, and it's arranged so that it's going to combine those two into a single beam. Now that single beam coming out here could either be D or A. And that depends on the phase relation when those two get recombined. So how can I tell if it's D or A here? I can put in a, I could rotate a polarizer if I could find one. Here's one. I could put a polarizer in here and I could rotate it and I can make it you know, dim or bright. So that's proving that I do have polarization here. Okay. So now to analyze the polarization, instead of using a polarizer, I'll use a third calcite crystal, which is set up in the uh, AD configuration. So it puts out one beam here, and I can prove that it's polarized by putting my polarizer here and rotating it. Okay, so that, that has this, this polarization off of it. Okay, so there's only one spot coming out there. Now, as promised, if I simply change the phase relation between uh, these two paths slightly, very slightly, I, I can change the spot. So, so watch this spot over here when I change the phase. It switches to the other one. Now, if I keep rotating this knob in the same direction, I can switch it there and then keep rotating the same direction there. Keep rotating, keep rotating, keep rotating, keep rotating. I'm not rotating back and forth. I'm rotating in one in one direction. So it continually switches back and forth. It's an oscillatory behavior. Okay. So let's set it so it's uh, so it's there. So what's happening is I have this H and beams inside the interferometer. They're spatially separated. And when I re recombine them, I can either produce a D polarized beam or A polarized beam coming out depending on the phase relation between the two beams when they combine. Okay, so that's nice. Now here's the next nice uh, thing I can demonstrate. Remember I said if you block one path, it does something interesting. So what I have now is a, is a card here that's in between the two calcites inside the interferometer. And of course, if I block both beams, I get nothing, but if I move this very carefully, I can I can just block one of the two beams that's inside the interferometer. So here I go. So as I slide the, the beam block into just one of the beam paths, watch what happens over here. Suddenly, this one reappears. That's a little bit dimmer, isn't it? That's the 25%. Remember, as I, I explained that earlier, there'd be 25%. So here I have now both beams coming over here into my calcite and all the light is funneled or interfered into that path. If I block one beam, now it's happening. I block the beam in the interferometer. Now there's only one beam, which is uh, H coming into this calcite crystal. So we know what happens when one beam comes into a crystal it gets analyzed into two beams, D and A. And that's what this calcite is just separating them for. So that's kind of a cool thing. As I said with the electron examples, but let's say this is getting the goat and this is getting the car. Now I have it set up so I'm never getting the car. But now 
if I block a, a one path in interferometer, now I can win the car. So clearly this is not classical addition of probabilities. Something very, very different. Now, uh, to, to be candid, you can explain all of this uh, physics I'm showing here using classical wave physics. It's really just the interference of waves. And I'm not launching single photons through this apparatus. I'm launching a laser beam, which is more or less a classical wave. <clears throat> so you might say, well, this didn't really prove anything about quantum physics. Therefore, on Thursday, Henning Weyer from QTools is going to demonstrate the same experiment using single photons and show that it, that it does work still. Okay, so that's what I did. I rotate a knob, I move the beams back and forth, and then this just shows another cartoon, I mean, I mean the photograph of the actual apparatus for, for later reference. We had the, the laser splitting in the HV calcite, making two beams, which you couldn't see on the, on the screen, but I could see them here. And then the knob just tilts this uh, calcite crystal slightly. This is the second crystal. It's flipped around, so it combines H and V into a single beam. And then this uh, third rota uh, rotated crystal is a DA analyzer, and there's a lens, and it sends uh, the, the whatever comes out onto the screen there. Okay. So if I tilt it, it switches back and forth like that. Tilt, switches. Okay, or if I put a beam block in here, I can now, I have two beams. If I, I only have one at the output here, as you can see. And if I move this beam uh, block into one path, that's what I was doing when you couldn't see what I was doing. Here it goes. Move it in. It blocks one of these beams. Now there's only one beam coming to this crystal, so it naturally has to split into two. So I've recovered now some light power in this other beam that used to be missing when I had interference. Okay. So just to um, emphasize this with cartoon pictures, this is what the apparatus looked like. D goes in, or I think I had A going in, doesn't matter. And it gets split into V and H beams separated. And these two crystals are oppositely oriented. So when the V and H go through it, they get recombined back into one beam. It could be D or A, and whether it's D or A depends on the phase relation that you impart in this inside this interferometer. And I'll use a third crystal just to analyze whatever is, is coming out of this beam. So here I just have one beam coming out. Okay, if I tilt this crystal, it changes the beam paths, changes the phase, and it flipped, you see. It flipped from there to there. Okay. Now we reduce the picture even, even further. If we're looking down on, on the setup from, from the top, we see these two crystals. We see a pole goes in and it gets split into two separated beams as calcites like to do. And then when it goes to this flipped crystal, they get recombined. And the polarization of this output beam could be either A or, or, or D or something in between. And it depends on the um, the phase difference, which I'm going to show now. When I tilt this crystal, the path length of the upper beam when it comes back to recombine on the axis is slightly different than it was before. So this was the original path, now this is the longer path. And because the path length is different, uh, it, it accumulates more of a phase. Even in classical optics, you, you, you know that phase depends on how far you travel through a piece of glass which has a refractive index not equal to one air, the surrounding air has index word fraction equal to one, but the glass is about 1.4, 1.5. Okay. So, this is again the same picture. Here's a zoom pole. What is the polarization here? If I put a beam block here and I let the H pole go into this crystal, which is the flipped calcite, what is the polarization here?
Okay, we have six answers, but there's a bit of a spread to these answers. So instead of showing you other people's answers, I, I just want to make a few hints. This is an HV calcite. So the beam coming to the right, the one that we don't block is H. Now this is HB calcite. Now what happens when you put an H polar, polarized light to a, an HB calcite? You might think because I flipped it here, it, it makes a big difference, but it actually doesn't. I put H in to an HB calcite, Does it do anything to the polarization? If I put depolarized light here into an HP calcite, it splits it into an H beam and a V beam because a depolarized would have both H and V components. And the H goes through one, one path and the V gets deflected to a different path. But if I put pure H into an HV calcite, how many beams come out and what is the polarization? You're essentially analyzing an H polarized state with an HV analyzer. So I'll give you 20 seconds to change your vote if you want to. Of course, many people got it correct, so don't change it if you think you're correct. Okay, I will, I will end it there. So almost everybody uh, stated the correct answer here. It's, it's A and D. And if you just look at this one crystal, th this goes back to some of our earliest uh, classes in this, in this summer workshop, where if I put H into a D analyzer, it splits it up into uh, equal parts of A and D. 50-50. If I put a single photon here, it has a 50-50% chance of, of hitting this spot or this spot. So go back and if you didn't get that one correct, go back and review that. Okay, let's leave the poles for a minute here. And let's talk about classical particle traveling through a single opening. It could be a small hole or it could be a vertical slit, which you might slice into a a piece of black paper with a razor blade. Well, if I have a, a bunch of classical particles, think of those as tiny grains of sand flying through this little hole here, and they can scatter off of little bumps inside of this, this hole. Well, they're gonna scatter out and they're gonna produce a probability histogram, which is the number of events um, uh, uh, plotted as a function of the position if I split up this little region into a bunch of tiny bins or boxes, we'll get a histogram roughly like that, okay? It could be something like a Gaussian distribution, which is also called a normal distribution. Okay, now if I have two uh, slits in this barrier and I still have classical particles, well, because they're classical, we use classical probability. So the probability is just the sum of the two. So if I have uh, one openings here on the left, I can get this distribution. If I, if I close that one and open the one on the right, I'll get this distribution. But if I open them both, I'll just use the Laplace rule to add the probability. So I add this normal distribution to that normal distribution and I just get this double hump normal. There's certainly no interference going on here because there's only one classical particle flying through here at the same time. So the particle certainly don't interact, they can't collide. So there's no strange things going on. You just get a, a broader distribution like this, okay? But now let's do the same experiment with electrons. This experiment has been done. We have what's called an electron gun up here or electron emitter. It's just a hot piece of metal uh, and electrons come boiling off of it from, with high energy. And some, and, but they come off one at a time so one electron comes off, it goes through this, uh, this slit and lands here, or maybe it goes through this slit and it lands here and makes some little spots there. Okay, but, uh, but, but now 
of course, the quantum theory would predict that we get some kind of interference pattern. And that's actually what people have observed. You don't get this broader distribution like they did with the classical sand particles. You get these places where there's zero probability, nearly, for the electron to land. And that's very odd, right? Because it's just one electron traveling through this region. We don't know anything about what happens there. We, we're not watching this. It's all in an in, enclosed uh, chamber. We can't see inside there, okay? So is that really true, okay? Let's, um, let's watch a movie, okay? Uh, the Hitachi Company, uh, some 20 years ago, made a very nice demonstration of this experiment. It's a very famous YouTube video. And they had the source and uh, each electron could pass around this um, repelling barrier to the left or to the right. The barrier, well, electrons are negatively charged. So to make a repelling barrier, you just take a, a metal wire and you put a little bit of negative charge on it. So the electron is repelled away from that. So it's gonna go around to the left or the right. And we also put some negative charge on these plates out here so it, it can't keep going, it gets deflected back. So each electron will land someplace on this detector, which is a uh, kind of like a, um, like a camera, it has pixels. And if it lands at a certain pixel, it makes a bright spot. Okay, so here, here comes the spots. And I'm gonna now show the movie. Now we are looking at the detector plane on the monitor. Bright spots appear here and there. These spots indicate individual electrons. Electrons are sent out only occasionally. Therefore, the chance of finding one electron in the microscope is very small, not to mention the chance of finding two. Uh, since electrons are detected one by one as particles, we have to conclude that each electron must have passed through at random on either side of the biprism thus creating a uniform distribution without any interference when accumulated. Under such conditions do electrons form a uniform distribution? But look, we begin to see some fringes in the perpendicular direction that looks like interference fringes. Since this experiment lasted for more than 30 minutes, I have sped the movie up. Interference fringes are now clearly visible. Cool. We have lots of nice YouTube events here we could watch, but no, let's go back to our physics. Okay, fantastic. So indeed, each of these spots is one electron arriving at the camera. And over time, they build up this histogram, which definitely has some dark regions in it, which are regions where the electron simply is not likely to land. And this is purely because of quantum interference. You could, you could never see this type of dynamics um, or probabilities with a classical probability theory. Okay. Um, th th there's a characteristic length scale for elect electrons when they travel at a certain speed, which is called the, the wavelength or lambda, the Greek symbol lambda. And in this case, the characteristic length was five times 10 to the minus 12 meters. It's a very small length. So if one goes through the mathematics, you can predict the separation between these dark uh, fringes using this uh, wavelength and the geometry of the setup. We're not going to go through that in detail here. But let's consider the following. This is what we just showed, where the electron can travel from the, the source to the detection screen. And there are two quantum pathways it could travel. Some of them interfere constructively on the bright regions, and some interfere destructively on the dark regions. But now, what if we make an observation in the middle? How can we do that? We'd like to know, if possible, which path did the electron take? Did it go through the left slit or the right slit? The way we can do that is to shine a very bright light source onto this region. If the electron goes through 
this slit, we're going to see a bright a flash of light here. If it goes through this slit, we're going to see a bright flash of light someplace in this region. And we put a camera to the side, or you just look with your eyes, and you can see these flashes, you know, flash, 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 flash. So the, 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 the poll uh, question is the following. Zoom poll three. The hint is, does identifying or detecting which path the electron takes, does that convert the situation into a classical kind of probability theory? <clears throat> and I will end that poll and answer in the affirmative. So yes, when you detect which path it goes through, it's like you're, you're, you're restarting the experiment. And if you restart the experiment right here, then the electrons just fly down here with, with no interference because there's only one way to get from, say, this point down to the, the screen at this point, or only one way to get from this point down to the screen here. The reason you see quantum probability interference when there is no light turned on is because uh, there, there's two ways to get from the, uh, the source to a point on the screen. So those two ways or paths can interfere. But if you make a detection after the screen, then from each new starting point, there's only one way to get to the final position. That's straight from that point down to the final position. So it re reverts back to the classical probabilities. And so, you can see without the light exposing which path the electron took, there's regions like here where there's very low probability for the electron to land. But then when you start flashing the light here, you essentially disrupt everything. And now it reverts to a classical distribution. And there's now a higher probability, quite large, in the same spot here where there used to be very low probability. So what's going on? In some sense, you could say that when the light scatters from the electron, it messes up the phase. It, it, it scatters randomly. And when light scatters from the electron, it can impart a small momentum kick that changes the phase of the quantum state slightly and randomly. And that reverts it to a classical like probability situation. <clears throat> okay interference disappears. That's analogous in some way to this experiment we talked about earlier. If I have both beams going through my interferometer combining here, they combine coherently to, to create just one spot with nothing there. But if I block one path, I'm restarting the experiment with a new starting point, namely one beam. So now there's only one way to get to either to say A, there's only one way to get to D. So there's no interference. Therefore, I get both spots. Both can happen. Good. Zoom poll four. Let's go back to the classical maze problem. I just want to review this. Last time we did a classical maze with probabilities one third and two thirds at these junctions. Now I'm going to say that at each junction, just to change up the problem for your practice, now the, there's going to be a one half probability that the particle goes through straight or the particle turns. And then when it gets to this junction, there's also one half probability that it goes straight or turns. If it's coming from here, it's half probability it goes straight or turns. What is the probability using a um, a tree diagram that that it will go out exit one. Pole four. Okay. 
this is a classical problem, remember, not a quantum problem. Okay, everybody got that one correct? Excellent. So we have one half, one half, one half, one half, one half, one half. So the classical theory says we multiply the two independent events and then we add to that the product of the other two independent events and we add them up and we get a half. Good. Now we have the quantum maze problem. Looks like an interferometer. I have two beam splitters here. Each one is a 50-50 beam splitter. So if a photon hits that beam splitter come from the entrance, it can either reflect with 50% probability or it can go straight. So it can turn or go straight. And the same thing here, it can go straight or turn. It can go straight or it can turn. Okay, what is the probability it will go out exit one? That's number five. So we will end there. And there's a, a little bit of a spread. Most people got the correct answer. But the point is that the, the, the actual answer depends on details. Remember when I had my interferometer, my polarization interferometer, I could move one of the optical elements just by a tiny, tiny amount. And I switched the answer from one output to the other output. And I could also make them equal probabilities. I can make the probability zero or one half or one just by changing some tiny details. And since in this poll, I didn't tell you what the details are, you just have to say it could be anywhere between zero and one because I didn't tell you. But I can say now, if I were to move this beam splitter by a tiny, tiny amount, I could make it 100% probable to go out the exit one. If I moved it again a tiny amount, I can make it 100% probable to go out exit two. If I moved it to an in-between position, I could have 50-50 probability to go out exit one and two. In fact, if you think hard enough about it, this is similar to when Henning showed rotating the polarizer in front of a polarized light beam the transmission probability was equal to cosine squared of the angle, which means it could be zero, could be a quarter, could be a half, could be seven eighths, could be one, just depending on how you rotate that angle. So instead of rotating uh, a polarizer here, we're gonna just slightly move a beam splitter and we can change the probabilities anywhere between zero and one. Of course, they have to add to one. So it's cosine squared plus sine squared equals one. Okay, next zoom poll. This is from the reading. If you didn't do the reading and you didn't know this before, you probably have no clue what the answer is, which is fine. If you did the reading, you might remember. Is the process unitary? Yes, indeed, it is. Um, that's just a word, okay? Unitary is a word that quantum physicists use to, to describe a situation where interference is possible, where it's occurring. So um, anytime you see interference occurring, you know that can be described by a unitary description. Now, we've seen unitary descriptions before many times because that has to do with adding the state arrows. Whenever you have to add the state arrows to get interference and then do a projection onto the measurement axis and then square the 
projection to get their probability. That's representing interference. And this whole process is called unitary. But don't worry about why it's called that. It's just a mathematical term. Okay. So here's what I just said, right? Anytime you add the state arrows for the two ways to arrive at the final state and then square the length of the projection on the measurement axis, when this is the proper mathematics to use to get the probability, that means you're describing a unitary process. If you do something to disrupt it, remember like, like detect one of the particles or one of the paths rather, detect the particle in one of the paths or block one of the paths, you, you, you change the situation. If, if you randomize, if I flipped a phase just from here to here by known amount, that's still unitary because I know everything possible to know. Remember, the definition of a quantum state is a description that represents everything that's possible to know and you know it all. You know everything possible to know. Therefore, you can use a state arrow to represent the state, and you can also use state arrows to represent interference. But if if you do something that that destroys your 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 knowledge, uh, it may change the situation. So I think I have a question here, which is a a Jamboard. So go into the um, into the chat window. Click on the Jamboard link. Okay, and there may be, there, there is more than one answer. So I see one person posted a possible answer. You can support that if you like it, but you can also write a different answer, which we have also discussed earlier in this session. There's more than one way to do this. Ah, I see three answers. Okay, in this case, there's no calcite crystal, but there are, are, are partial reflectors, which are, this is an electron. So we can't, there are some kind of beam splitters that work for electrons, but I know what you mean by just the calcite crystal. That's, that, that, that's um, I would write that as, So I, I like the answers, um, add light to observe which path. That would work, that, that would restart or reset the, the state. So now let's say we have detected in the upper path. Now there's only one way to get to the exit, that is to reflect from the beam splitter. So because there's only one way to get there, there's no more quantum interference. Therefore, you can use classical probability. If you block one of the paths, same thing. If you block the upper path, then it can only go to the lower path. If I, here's a new one I hadn't thought of. Remove one beam splitter. I, I like that one. That's thinking out of the box. Outside this box, we just take away a beam splitter and now there's just, um, yeah, only one way to get there. Cool. Um, add heat or vibration. That, that's a, a very nice one. I hadn't thought of that one, although it's, it's somewhat hinted in the book, I think. If you start to vibrate this whole apparatus, which you can do by just heating it up, and you know that heat uh, imparts uh, microscopic vibrations, uh, random motions of all the atoms in this, um, in this setup, this is a physical device like a, a crystal or something, and there's little pathways here the electron has to follow. And if you heat it up, when the electron travels through here, it's going to get jiggled by some of the thermal motion that's going to change the phase. And that's going to change the phase randomly. 
And if you change the phase in, in both paths randomly, or even one path randomly, it destroys interference. So heating or vibrating is an excellent answer. Um, this one though, is this one about adjusting the calcite crystal. I think what that means is do nothing except move one of these uh, junctions slightly. That's like adjusting the calcite crystal, like tilting the calcite crystal. You're changing, you're making one path a little bit shorter, one path a little bit longer. Now that changes the phase of the path, but do you think this answer is correct? Would adjusting the calcite crystal or changing the phase of the path, would that modify the setup so it obeyed classical probability theory? You wanna vote on that? Okay, you can vote on these two options here by putting check marks in the boxes. Or you can just write a comment. Yeah, good, good. There's a, a box in a box. The, yeah, the, the answer, the answer is, is no, I agree with that answer. And that's because if you, if you just change the phase in the two paths or one path by moving one of the beam splitters, you could still keep interference, but you would change the probability from one into the upper path, maybe to one in the lower path, as we've seen in our interferometer. But it does not change the classical. That, that's absolutely correct. So I just took a screenshot of all your great answers. Okay, let us go back to our keynote slides, which I now hope you see on the screen again. Boom. So the answer I came up with was put uh, electron detectors in, in the two paths. And if you get a click on one of them, boom, that leaves what we call a permanent trace in the setup. Now in, in the book, I talk about permanent traces uh, quite a lot. And by that, I mean that there's some classical recording of the information that you've gained. So if this thing produces a click, you can hear the click and you could record that with a tape recorder. If it produces a bit in a digital computer, you can store that. You could read that out and write it on a piece of paper and store that. It's a permanent physical trace. If um, I think in the book I said there were tiny springs in, inside of the path. If you set up tiny springs here, if the electron bounces off of a spring, it can cause that spring to heat up because metal springs have internal friction. So then you can measure the temperature of the spring and that'd be a, rec a permanent recording of the temperature. So any kind of a permanent physical trace that's left behind here or left behind here will change the situation because, as I said before, it restarts the problem. The electron forgets that it came from a unitary process at the first beam splitter, it now restarts it at a known location, and that's now a classical situation. Okay, is this process unitary? The, the process of putting uh, detectors into these paths. So remember, a unitary situation means that you have to use quantum probability theory to correctly predict the probabilities. So I could have asked this question that way, but that's what unitary means. So almost everybody said, no, that is the correct answer. Very good, because when you detect which particle, uh, which path the particle has been in, or is now in, uh, that 
um, essentially destroys the, the quantum of interference and we now can use classical probability. So it would only be unitary in the previous case, like here, where there's no detectors, because now from the entrance, there's two possible ways it could reach exit one, right? Upper path or lower path. And if there's no uh, heat or vibration or detectors or beam blocks or anything to disrupt the quantum unitary process, then we must use quantum interference to get the answer. So then it's unitary. But if we do anything else, to disrupt it, it's not unitary. So I have this little cartoon here. This is when you go camping, you, you leave no trace, right? You go out and a day later you come back. And so I see you go out and I see you come back. But when you come back, you could come back to two different um, trailheads, okay? If you were a quantum particle, and you left no trace, namely you removed all your garbage, then if you were really quantum, I'd have to use quantum probability theory to predict the probability that you would return at one trailhead or the other trailhead. But if you left a bunch of garbage back along your trail, I could go and find that garbage. And I could figure out which path you went. And then just before you reached back at the uh, trailhead, I could predict using classical probability theory which trailhead you would exit at. Okay, that's a little, we should all get that badge, right? Okay, so to summarize unitary processes, they can all be described in terms of rotation of phase arrows. So I said earlier that they can be described in terms of state arrows. That is true, but now I'm gonna introduce something also called phase arrows, which is a, a different arrow Okay, so I'm gonna let's take a, a five minute break it's because we're changing the topic um, quite a bit here. And so uh, time to rest our brains a little bit and, and empty out all the old thoughts in your brain and uh, get ready to have some new thoughts. So see you in five minutes. Let's, let's um, do a Zoom poll number eight, just to emphasize unitary processes. Okay, this is an interesting one in that we had a, a range of answers. So D, I definitely agree with. If I tilt one crystal to change the length of the path, I still have interference, namely the outgoing polarization could be switched from A to D or D to A. So that's still a unitary process. But this uh, B here, which says inserting a polarizer into the interferometer, that's actually an interesting one. That could be correct. When I wrote this, I wasn't thinking that, but I think that could be correct because if I put a polarizer there, that would just change the amplitude. So let's say I put a polarizer in, in the V beam only. Okay. Or yeah, for example, a polarizer in the V only. So let's say I rotated it to, to um, uh, say I transmitted A polarization here. So I'd have A polarization entering here and H polarization entering here. And when the A entered here, that would be decomposed into H and V. The V would go down this way and the H would actually deflect, no, the H would go straight through, right? H goes straight through. So it would change the situation. Some of the light would be lost in this beam here. And if I put a detector here, I wouldn't have 100% probability to see something. So it's kind of halfway between. The, the, the process of the, the polarizer here, uh, it's losing some of the light, but it's not losing all the light. 
So if you put a beam block here, it loses all the light. If I put a polarizer here, either rotates it or if it's a calcite type polarizer or if it's a film type polarizer, it blocks one, loses some light, redirects the beam. So the situation becomes more complicated. You lose some probability, you split the one beam into two beams, and so it's a more complicated process. So I, I'd be willing to, to accept B as, a, as an okay answer as well. It's just not obvious. So D, D is, is definitely the answer correct. A B is partially correct, depending on how sophisticated you are in the theory. Okay, let's try number nine. I talked about the half-wave plate in last class, and Henning showed a demonstration of one. It transforms the polarization. And I showed a, a grid and arrow diagram to show how that works. Possibly one or two of you weren't able to be at that class. So if you're not sure, you don't have to click. Okay, five seconds, three, two, one. Okay, most people said yes, because it involves only known phase change and that is correct. So remember what happens is this polarization arrow, which is in this case, 22.5 degrees from the vertical, it gets flipped around the polarization axis of the device and gets flipped down to here, which is now 22 and a half degrees away from this axis or, or minus 22 and a half from the horizontal, which is 67.5. And the way we explained how that happened was just a purely a phase change. I think I have a, yeah, here it is, right? We started out with this angle, 22 and a half, which is composed of this long green one, which is the component along the wave plate axis the wave plate is made with a crystal, so it has an axis. And there's a small amount of perpendicular polarization. I add those two together and I get this red state, which is the initial state. And I just go through the wave plate, it just does a phase flip. So the plus 0.38a becomes minus 0.38a. I add those up together and I end up with the final state. So it's, it's only a phase change. And a pure phase change is, uh, as long as you know what that phase change is, then you can still use quantum probability to predict the outcomes. And you can see this really is a type of interference. You can say here, the, the green arrow, oh, I'm sorry, it's not interference. It's quantum superposition. The green arrow is superposed with the blue arrow to make the red arrow. It's not interference because there's only one way to, to get through here. So let us now introduce a Mach Zender interferometer named after two people, Mach and Zender, who studied this probably a hundred years ago or so. It, it's a, it's a, called a two path um, interferometer. It's different than the one that I showed in my demonstration, which was a polarization splitting interferometer. This one just has beam splitters. And so the idea is, we have mirrors and beam splitters. And if we send a one watt beam into this interferometer, we, we have it arranged so that there's equal path lengths going in the upper path and lower path. Let's assume they're exactly equal. Now I've color coded these beam splitters with a red side and a blue side because it actually matters which one you go into and which one you come out. So here you went into red and came out red. Here you went into red and came out blue. Here you went into red and came out red. Here you went into blue 
and came out red. Turns out that if you know how these things work in the theory, that you could predict that quantum interference or classical interference, if you're dealing with classical light waves, will lead to all the power, one watt, coming out in this path. That's just the way these are built. And notice that here I have the red on the top and here I have the blue on the top. So remember, it's kind of like the calcite crystals. I flip one relative to the other to get the interference that I, that I want. Okay, but you know, if I slightly move one of these mirrors, that's gonna change the path length in the lower arm, and that's gonna flip the power from the, this, this beam here up to that beam, because I've changed the phase. But the way it's set up now, all the power comes out this path. Okay, so here we go. We have one watt there, zero watts there. If I block one beam, well, now I get one quarter of a watt out of both of these because a half a watt was lost on this block. So we have destroyed the interference. And if I block the other beam, then of course I still get half and half because I've destroyed the interference. Okay. And we're back to this situation. Let's try to understand this in more detail in terms of phase. So now we're dealing with traveling waves. Light is a traveling wave. Whether you treat it classically or in quantum theory, it's, it's still a traveling wave. So here's a picture of a wave. It's a wave amplitude. Um, and it's the traveling wave, which means that this whole pattern moves to the right. And if you think about moving this pattern a little bit to the right, this peak moves over here this whole pattern moves over, which means this point goes up a little bit because the wave is now here. And this wave has moved from here over to here. So the wave is now here. So this point has gone down a little bit. So at each point, it just goes up and down. Remember that oscillating little ball that I illustrated earlier? Each point just goes straight up and down. But since they do so in a synchronized and coherent manner, the whole wave pattern propagates steadily to the right. Now in classical physics, the wave amplitude is the electric field. That's a well-defined classical entity. In quantum physics, the wave amplitude is not electric field, but it's quantum possibility. Remember, those are the things that are state arrows that we have to uh, combine and project and square. Now the complicated thing here is that there's not only two quantum possibilities, there's an infinite number because at every point in space, there's a different quantum possibility and they all oscillate synchronously in a wave pattern. So the mathematics gets more complicated. So let's not try to do the mathematics. Let's just draw pretty pictures. So this just labels the peaks and the valleys. The positive peaks are labeled with a solid line. The negative peaks, or called valleys, are labeled with a dashed line. And this whole pattern moves together to the right. Okay. The separation between these two positive peaks is called lambda, the wavelength. And the separation between a positive peak and a negative peak is called lambda over 2, half the wavelength. Now for a, a visible light wave, the wavelength is approximately 500 nanometers. That's 500 times 10 to the minus nine meters. It's very small. That explains why in an interferometer, if I just change the path length by a very tiny, tiny amount, I can change the phase and therefore affect the interference. Okay, now here's this nice little cartoon showing the relationship between a rotating um, clock, if you like, a phase clock, and an oscillating point. So this is like the amplitude at a fixed point on the wave as the wave travels past. I see a question. See if I can go to the chat window. <laughs> okay. Somebody's just asking for a private conversation, which is perfectly fine. 
please uh, just shoot me an email afterwards and we can chat. So this is a nice little graphic. This is called a phase clock. It, it's not a real clock. It doesn't measure time. It indicates phase. Also, it's not a state arrow. A state arrow, we always draw in a, in a square grid. This is drawn on a circle, which looks more like a clock. So I call this the phase clock. And it points to different phase values. So here's zero phase, here's 90 degree phase, 180 degree phase, 270 degree phase. So if I have a, uh, a path, a photon traveling on a path, and let's say that path is defined to have a certain length, which corresponds to a zero phase, like a reference, a, a reference point. And then let's say I increase the path just a little bit. That's going to result in rotating this phase arrow from zero degrees to nine degrees. If I rotate it to 180 degrees, that's like a change of sign, right? And then if I keep going, I get back to zero degrees. So this is now a, a, the second mathematical tool that we introduce in quantum physics. The first tool was the state arrow. Now we have the phase arrow or the phase clock. And this kind of description is, is very useful in all of physics because much of physics has to do with oscillations, harmonic oscillators, Fourier analysis, waves, things like that. And, and this kind of phase representation is very useful to have a, a visualization of the mathematics. Okay, so here we have, uh, we're gonna illustrate the phase clocks. Okay, there they are. So this is defined to be zero phase. So it's pointing, uh, the phase clock is pointing vertically. At this point in the wave, the phase clock has been rotated to 180 degrees, which is a change of sign from positive amplitude to negative amplitude, because zero is a line that goes through here. Okay. Now, as this wave propagates by, if I sit at one point here, you can see the, the phase clock is going to rotate around as the wave travels by. Those are the labels. I don't think we have a nice animation, but if I did, I could animate this whole wave traveling to the right and all these phase clocks spinning around together. Okay, excellent. So unitary process <clears throat> is one that can be described in terms of state arrows and to keep track of your state arrows, which ways they're pointing and uh, that you need to well, you can use the phase arrows as a tool. They're, they're not directly measurable, but they have physical consequences because if you change the phase of one of the paths, it changes the probabilities. Uh, a rotation of a phase arrow cannot be described simply in terms of the intermediate classical outcomes. So by intermediate classical outcomes, I refer, for example, to um, shining the light on the electron and determining its location one path or the other. That, would, that process would not simply be rotating a phase zero. That would be restarting the problem completely. Okay, however, um, moving uh, a calcite crystal slightly to change a phase would correspond to rotating the phase zero, and that can change you from a constructive interference to a destructive interference. Also, as we know, changing the phase or rotating a phase arrow can change the rotation of polarization. That's how a half wave plate works, as we saw. Okay, so let's look at this example. Let's think of more about the path interferometer called the Mach center interferometer. So is there a phase shift on reflection from a mirror? Well, here's the animation of a wave, bounces off of a mirror, and it flips from positive to negative. Let's, let's take that as our standard reference for what a mirror does. Okay, now not all mirrors do this, but let's consider this to be our standard mirror because it turns out that everything is only relative anyway. So we need to pick a convention and work from it. So a standard mirror in, in this lecture will, will be one that flips the phase from zero to 180 every time light 
bounces off of it. Uh, the reason we drew this picture here is because this is the same thing that happens if you have a long skinny rubber band which is tied firmly to a point on the wall and you shake it and launch a wave at it when it bounces off the wall it flips the sign it goes down you can try that experiment if you haven't tried that before okay so it's a similar you know analogous mathematics Okay, so that means that if we represent our traveling wave at an instant in time with a, uh, a positive peak uh, called a peak and then a trough and a peak and a trough and a peak and the trough at this moment in time is hitting the mirror. If there were no face flip, then coming this distance from here to here is the same as this distance from here to here. Therefore, this would be a solid line if there were no 180 degree phase shift. But because there's a phase shift where it would have been a zero phase, it's now a 180 phase. And where it would have been a 180 phase, it's now a zero phase. So you can see at this snapshot, at an instant in time, there's been a phase shift. So if I could animate this picture, all these lines would move to the right, all these lines would move to the vertical direction, and those phase relations would, would be maintained as they're shown. Okay. So now let's consider why a beam splitter is asymmetric. Okay, we have a red side and a blue side. In reality, they're both clear, but they have an internal uh, difference uh, the way the thing is built. So the convention here is that phase of transmitted light is unaltered. So it goes positive, it goes a uh, peak trough, peak trough, peak trough, peak, no, no difference. Okay, but the reflected one goes peak trough, peak trough, trough, peak, trough, so the reflected one. If you go into the red side and come out the red side, you get a phase flip. That's how this particular beam slur works. But notice, if you go into the blue side, the blue color-coded side, now what happens is, again, the transmitted light is unaltered, so you have peak, trough, peak, trough, peak, trough, peak, but the reflected light is also unaltered. So this beam splitter does not act like, like a standard mirror. It's the opposite because I go peak, trough, peak, trough, peak, trough, peak. So the rule is we color coded this so that if you go into the blue and come out the blue, there's no phase shift. But if you go into the red and come out the red, there is a phase shift. And th that's actually how some real beam splitters work. It's, it's not a toy model, it's a real model. So now let's consider the interferometer. Amoxander, okay, boom. We come in with light. If we come in with um, uh, red light, oh, this, sorry, not interferometer, this is a beam splitter. Red light comes into this side to the red and it can transmit out the blue or the red sides. Blue light comes into the blue. It can transmit through, the, through, through, through this way or that way. And notice what happens. If these are in phase when they're coming in, so this is, uh, a peak, that's a peak. This one goes peak, trough, peak, trough, peak, trough, peak. And the blue one does the same, peak, trough, peak, trough, peak, trough, peak. So they're in phase when they come out of this beam splitter. However, look at the other beam. The red one gets a phase shift, but the blue one does not. So now they're out of phase. So when you add two waves, they're out of phase. If they have the same amplitude, they add to zero. So in this case, there's no light coming out here and all the light comes out here. Of course, that depends on the phase relationship between the two incoming beams. Okay, this just shows what happens on each, on each one separately. So now let's consider and putting these together. Um, well, first we're gonna consider what happens if the incoming lights beams are out of phase. So this one is a trough and this one's a peak. When they travel together and they interfere, you have the blue one is trough, peak, trough, peak, peak, <laughs> trough, peak, because it went in the red side and came out the red side, so it picked up a phase shift. Whereas the red one transmits, there's never a phase shift on transmitting. So now this one, uh, this beam has constructive interference and this beam has destructive interference. So now all the power is in this beam and there's no power in this beam. 
and we had still the same situation as before. We only changed the phase of this blue uh, colored beam. Now notice these colors are not the color of light. All this light's the same color. It's, it's all green, for example, because the lines are green. The, the, the red and blue colors are only uh, coding the phase values. Well, that's not true. They're, they're coding uh, which, which beam you're in, just to keep track of things. But all the light is green. All the light has the same polarization. So we're only talking about path interference. Okay, so now we're gonna put them together. Well, this says iClicker. This is from an old lecture that uh, one of my former PhD students put together. We taught the course, we had iClickers. Um, now we have uh, zoom poles, right? So what is the phase at the indicated point from paths one and two? We don't have a, a poll question here, so just think about the answer or write it down on a piece of paper. So at this point where it says here, what is the phase of the light here that's coming from this beam path one? And what is the phase here of the light coming from path two when it tra travels up here? They have to remember the rule. I'll just tell you again. Uh, when you enter into a red side of the beam splitter and exit the red side, you get a phase shift. All other cases, there's no phase shift. So here they're out of phase, right? This is peak, this is trough. This one transmits, this one enters blue and exits blue. So there's no phase shift when it goes through blue, blue. So if this is a trough, this is still a trough and a trough is 180. This one is a peak. It goes peak, trough, peak. So it's a peak. So it's zero. So it's 180 and zero. So the answer is C. Okay. I know this is a lot, a lot to, to absorb right now. It's not in the book. So if you don't follow all these details, come back and study these slides. I'll post them on, on, on the, um, on the Google Drive. So if you don't follow the exact details, you can't get the answer this or that. Uh, it's not important. The important thing is just the overall concept. Cool. I got it right. Good. Um, I think now we're doing the second question, which is what about over here? See if you can get this one. I'll give you a uh, What's the phase of the two waves, this, this wave and this wave at this point? I'll give you uh, 45 seconds. Okay, we'll stop there. So both are 180. Let's see if we can figure that out. So this one coming through goes through, so there's no phase shift. So trough, peak, trough, that's 180. This one is red to red, 
uh, entrance in red, exit in red. So there's a phase shift. So trough, peak, trough, peak. I think the answer is wrong here. I don't know why it's wrong. Should be trough, peak, trough, peak. Peak should be zero. So I think the answer is wrong here. I don't know why. It's an old slide. Dr. Raymer, about this question. I think yeah. you get um, 180 because the red side has a phase shift. Oh, so I was wrong. Amy's usually right. Okay, so um, the red side of phase shift. So it's trough, peak, trough, trough. Yep, absolutely correct. Thank you very much. I forgot to flip the phase. So that's why I said earlier, if you get the wrong answer, don't feel bad. You know, this is physics. And the more mistakes you, learn, uh, you make, uh, the more you learn. That's how you do physics. So I never feel embarrassed about getting the wrong answer. That's, that's a, something I had to learn over many years as a student and as a, a younger professor. I'm always the one who, who asks dumb questions, like in, in colloquiums and, and seminars. So thank you for that uh, um, correction. Both 180 is the correct answer. Okay, final slide, I think. Um, what are quanta? So we talked about quantum mechanics. And uh, a quantum is the singular uh, version of, of the word. Quanta is the plural version of the word. So I would say there, there's two ways to answer this. Um, the very last one says photons are quanta. That's true, and electrons are quanta. So a single photon is a single quantum. This is just how we use the language. But it's important to realize that it's more subtle than that because photons are not really objects. You can't say they're objects because in, in a way an object already implies that it has a, a position and a momentum and a definite you know, angular momentum. It's not really an object. A photon is more of an abstract mathematical conception represented by state. So when we talk about the photon went there, the photon went so over here, might have gone through this slit, might have gone through that slit. That's very sloppy and even wrong language. But it's almost impossible to talk for more than 10 minutes without saying something like that. You can't always keep saying, oh, the photon is an abstract mathematical entity that's not really an object, but it only predicts the probabilities of your detectors going click. But that's actually what it is. Though that's why these upper statements are also true. The energy of an electron is a quantum. The polarization of a photon is a quantum. In other words, the polarization state of a photon is a quantum. That's just a funny way of saying that the photon is not an object or a particle. It's represented by mathematics and the mathematics represent probability possibilities or probability amplitudes, which is a purely mathematical conception. Um, whether a photon reflects on a beam splitter or not is a quantum because it can come out in one of two states, the reflected state or the transmitted state. So it goes into a superposition of the two states. So it's a qubit. So the state of this whatever thing, photon, is, is a quantum. Uh, this says up downness of a silver atom. Uh, that, that refers to uh, spin, whether it's clockwise or counterclockwise spin of an electron in an atom. So this slide is just to remind us that we're not dealing with small particles that are objects that are flying around doing this or that. We're, we're dealing with something that's very intangible and very hard to put your finger on. However, if you put a lot of them together, some protons, some electrons, some neutrons, you can make an atom. And then you can make molecules and you can make many molecules together and you can build whatever you want. 
right? You could build an object like a grain of sand. The grain of sand is really an object and it's always treated by classical probability. So there's a very strange problem in the theory, understanding how this happens. How can you put together a bunch of purely mathematical abstract entities, which are only describable by state vectors, put together enough of, enough of those, and together they will make a physical object, which you can pick up, you can measure, you can see how heavy it is, you can throw it around, you can scatter light from it, it becomes a physical object. This is, in some sense, an unsolved problem in theoretical physics. 